So what we'll, what we'll be uh, seeing uh, right now is a uh, sci-fi, the sci-fi module. So the sci-fi module is uh, it's basically a, a large stack of numerical uh, algorithms. Uh, and it's, the, the reason it's important is it contains basic numerical algorithms, and these are things that you do not want to recode. There, you, there has been for a long time a tradition of uh, recoding basic numerical algorithms, especially if you're a physicist. When I, when I did my, my PhD, I was told you just, you're just going to code these things because it will teach you math, basically. That's a very bad idea because uh, it's, it's easy to do a bad version and hard to do a good version. Uh, so uh, it's, I feel it's really important to go over the sci-fi library just so that people know what's in there so that they can come back to it when they need it. Okay? So, sci-fi contains a lot of things. It contains, it's organized in sub-modules. So, uh, I that's the list of the main, well no, that's actually the list of the sub-modules that I will cover. So, I'll cover a lot of different sub-modules. And the danger, of course, is to get into a, a boring integration which I'll try to avoid. And so we're going to be skipping through several topics of uh, numerical analysis. Don't, don't be worried if you don't know anything about applied math or, or numerics. It's fine. And uh, I'll confess that there are some parts where I feel maybe lousy. I, I don't feel confident enough. So just to get you out of your ecosystem. And yeah, as a, as a warning slide, we could do a whole introduction to numerical computing, which we will not. All right, so who does not have the material now? You don't have the materials, do you? You do? Are you done them in advance? Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a work in progress version of the sci-fi lecture notes that is on my private web page uh, that I lost one by a couple of hours ago. Uh, and there's also one or two pen drives that are running around with the, with the material on them. Okay? Anybody else? By the way, if you had to avoid this becoming too boring, please do interrupt me. Let's try to, to make this a discussion rather than an enumeration. So the sci-fi in itself is composed of cost-specific sub-modules. Unlike, I guess, most of the packages that you've seen, nothing useful resides in the sci-fi namespace. There are things in the sci-fi namespace that's uh, Let's just quick, quickly have a look. So if we get more sci-fi, and we can't complete on sci-fi, there are lots of things. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things. Uh, don't use them. Uh, the reason being that this is historical, and there are these, these things are nothing but uh, direct import of the file. So let, let us not be confused. Let us use functions from NumPy when they come from NumPy and functions from SciPy when they come from SciPy. So we will use the sub-modules of, uh, of SciPy. And there are a bunch of different sub-modules, quite a lot. Uh, and I won't cover all of them, but I'll, I'll maybe you know, just look at them quickly. We have some uh, simple clustering that may be useful to do vector quantization. <coughs> we have a bunch of physical and uh, mathematical constants in, in SciPy with constants. We have Fourier transform that we'll uh, cover in FFT pack for a uh, fast Fourier transform pack. We have numerical integrations, whether it's computing the integral of a function or integrating a uh, differential equation and integrate. We have sci-fi not interpolate, that there's a bunch of different interpolation routines. We have some IO uh, uh, routines in sci-fi.io. 
We have linear algebra in the now. We have simple image uh, manipulation uh, in ND image because it's, it's called ND image because it works on arbitrary dimension image. If you have five dimension image, some people do, it will work. Uh, we have orthogonal distance regression. I have never used it. Maybe I should look at it once. Optimization, we'll cover it. Signal processing. Uh, sports matrices, oh, we're not covering sports matrices in this, in this uh, tutorial. Well, just keep in mind that if you ever need sports matrices, they are inside by sports. We have spatial data structures, we're not going to cover them, but basically, if you need to do like look at your neighbors in 2 or 3D, like if you need geographic information, uh, uh, systems, or if you need to compute distances, all kinds of different distances, like the computing distance, but also the Hamming distance and the Manhattan distance. Uh, they're all available in side by spatial. Spatial, there is side by special, which is a bunch of a special mathematical function that I'll cover in a minute. And we have basic statistics. Okay? And there might be other things that I forgot to list because. Uh, it's, this list was done a few years ago and I haven't checked it, it's still uh, up to date. So, if you're all ready, let's, let's get started and let's look at uh, SciPy IO. And I, I don't have IPython notebook for the simple things because I want you at least to copy paste. Maybe not type along, but at least to copy paste. So if you have the material, when there is a code example, you can click on the little arrows to make the uh, outputs disappear. So then it makes it really easy to copy paste in, uh, say, that by the way, or, or whichever one you prefer. Okay? Uh, because the, the what, what I'm trying to avoid is is what I call the shift enter tutorial, where people just run things by pressing shift enter and turn their brain off. So now you can copy paste and turn your brain. <laughs> Evolution has taught human beings to be uh, lazy. All right, so I'm going to bring this iPython notebook. Next to here, and we're going to start copy pasting. And we need to hide a few things. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is MATLAB files. So I don't know why on earth you would want to save and load MATLAB files, but you can do it. Uh, and so we're going to import SciPy IO. Uh, so we're going to import Just talking this uh, oil stuff. Okay, so we're going to import something IO, and we're going to create uh, a two D matrices of a two D array of ones. Okay, and then what we can do is we can save it into uh, a meta file, and meta files can contain several uh, uh, variables. So what we do is we give a dictionary that maps uh, variable names to uh, what we want to save. So basically, we're saving. Uh, the A array under the name A, okay? And then we can uh, load it back and display it. All right? So we do this. Uh, what happened? Oh, I forgot the one point. All Okay? <laughs> So there is there is one disclaimer is that MATLAB doesn't support well 1D arrays. In MATLAB everything is 2D because it thinks in terms of matrices. So if you do the same uh, and where the 1D array that you let me let me display the 1D array. So we have one here right here, and then we save it and load it back. 
Then what happens is it became two. All right? That's kind of hard. So why on earth would you want to say math applies by those things? But just in case it is. So that's the first thing. And the other thing that we can do with uh, uh, sci-fi IO, well, actually it's sci-fi MISC, it moved to MISC, is uh, uh, read um, uh, image files. So uh, we can do it. So if we have a file, if we have a PNG file, we can read it with in-read. We can also uh, use that method to do this, right? And so that's going to return whether, if it's a grayscale, it's going to return a 2D array. If it's a color uh, uh, um, uh, image, then it's going to return a 3D array, with the last I mentioned being the colors, that is going to be like 3 or 4 if you have, for instance. Does that make sense? Is it possible to really take back facts? It should be possible. Just in case it doesn't work for you, a second image which is a dedicated image processing uh, 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 toolbox uh, for Python, has a much more advanced uh, uh, image I, but it should be able to. Uh, and, and the second image also has good routines to save JPEG files. So basically, if you want a lot of image manipulation, you, at some point, you'll be using second image. Okay? <coughs> Any, any questions? So that's all I want to cover on uh, 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 sci-fi. So I started with a few very basic sub-modules and we're going to uh, move into more advanced uh, uh, features where we need to think of it more. The other thing that I think is useful to know is uh, sci-fi special. So basically sci-fi special are what's known as uh, uh, special functions, mathematical functions. So any, any word mathematical function, like a Bessel function, uh, like a gamma function, a log gamma, uh, you'll find it there. But basically, if you need any word uh, 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 mathematical functions, you'll find it there. So like the earth function. Uh, so on the, not in the list, all of them, of course, you'll find the list on the uh, documentation of sci-fi, if you ever need it. And usually, just I mean, if you Google sci-fi earth, function you'll find. Okay? Then linear algebra. So by the way, NumPy provides linear algebra. I don't know if you've used it so far. I would advise you to rather use sci-fi linear algebra. The reason is it's possible to compile NumPy linear algebra without a good linear algebra backing. The reason this is done is that some people don't care. But the problem is this can give you abysmal performance. Whereas it's not possible to compile sci-fi with a bad linear algebra packet. So you're more likely when you're using sci-fi linear to get a good linear algebra backend. And the difference in speed can be factors of 70 or more. Yeah. The, the computational linear algebra is something that people have been working on for a long time. So I would advise you to use sci-fi linear, but overall it's very similar. It has a very similar interface uh, uh, to uh, then uh, uh, the linear. So we have things to uh, uh, compute the determinant of a matrix. So my matrix here, I need a two D array. I don't know if uh, uh, you people have covered this before me, but NumPy has a matrix object that looks like an NumPy array, but is not an NumPy array. Don't use it. Just don't use it. The reason is because it looks like an NumPy array and it's not an NumPy array. So it behaves differently than an NumPy array on a few small places. And if you start mixing in your code matrices and arrays, at some point you'll get it wrong. And if you don't, a colleague will get it wrong, a library will get it wrong. So don't use them in the binary choice. Is there a way I can transform it? You can, you can like, transform a matrix to an array? Yeah. yeah, to array, the to array. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, matrices, 
Nepali linguists are really there for historiography. There are a few people in the world who hang out to them and think they're really cool, and almost everybody knows. So, I can do linear algebra, and I can find just a 2D array, and that will be my matrix, and I can uh, compute its determinant. And here, the determinant is minus 2. And uh, this is, I believe, a non-invertible matrix. So if I compute the determinant, it's 0. But you get a bit of screen in this case. So. <clears throat> and by the way, I can invert matrices with sci-fi.linear.in and let me try to invert the matrix above. Okay, so it crashed. It says it's a singular matrix, but it's non-invertible, and this makes sense because the determinant was zero. Okay? What if we really want, you guys know what a pseudo inverse is? A, a pseudo inverse is something where you multiply it to matrix that it gives either 1 or 0. It's not a real definition, but whatever. Anyhow, a pseudo inverse is an inverse that works even when the matrix is not invertible because it fills in with 1. So I can use PM to do this pseudo inverse. And I can multiply the array with its pseudo inverse using np dot, and I'm not taking one. But I see a lot of confused looks, so if you don't know what this is, don't mind. You don't need it. In this invert function, does it always do the same operation, or does it consider the structure? No, no, it always does the, 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 the same operation. The structure, the, the matrix here does not have a structure. It's just not a sparse matrix. If you're using sparse matrices, then, well, the first thing is you should probably not invert them. Yeah, you probably don't want to invert the sparse matrix, because if you invert in the sparse matrix, in many situations, not all, but in many situations, it's going to become dense. Not all. Yeah, okay, so if you have a diagonal matrix, it doesn't. Uh, uh, I do believe they have an invert, an inverse. I'm not sure. Might have an inverse method or not. Let's see. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, sci-fi import sparse. And, um, and then I'm going to create a, 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 a diag. Uh, uh, with uh, two, three, four. It's four arguments. So let's have a look at what it's as far as the SP9. So data diagonals MN. Okay, so it wants data. I want only one diagonal and I it's a three by three matrix. I think that should work. Okay, yeah. So that's my matrix. And let's see if I can if it has an inverse <coughs> method. I don't see anything. I ne I personally never inverse a matrix. I always I never inverse a matrix because I always plug it in a solar. Uh, I, 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 there are few use cases where it's legitimate to inverse a matrix. I'm teaching you to inverse matrices and I'm telling you not to. <clears throat> so you, what I do instead of inverting a matrix is I, I most often plug it into a solver that will because usually you invert a matrix to find the solution of an equation, of a, like a linear equation. So what you do is you use a solver, it's going to be much faster than inverting the matrix. Okay. 
Okay, and the last thing is you can get a singular value decomposition. A singular value decomposition, if you don't know, is wow, fancy. Mm. Uh, and I need to 
plot the measure, the, uh, I mean to plot the, the measures as a function of the measure time. So we're pretending we have measures at a given time. Okay? That's, that's my... That's my signal. So we, we have this thing, I don't know, maybe tide or, or uh, uh, amount of sunshine at, at a given time of day. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's fluctuating like this. And we have only a small number of measurements. And we'd like to interpret. Actually, technically, I should rather plot it like this <coughs> because I, I have those measurements. But now I would like to evaluate the underlying function that I do not know or I don't have data. So I'm going to need to, to do an interpolation. And the simplest interpolation is just to draw straight lines between the points. OK? So this is a 1D problem. And I can do interpolation where this I find dot interpolate dot interp 1D. And the way it works is I'm going to, so first import it, and then I'm going to give it the, basically the x and the y. And it returns something. So I'm giving it x and y, and it returns something. And what's this something? Mm -hmm. Well, this something is, is something that I can evaluate. Mm -hmm. I was about to say I can evaluate it, but it, I chose the wrong value. Okay, let me first, first do it when it works. This is something I can evaluate. So I'm asking, I, I'm asking this guy, return me the value at point two. And the value at point two is here, so it's just like around one, isn't it? And uh, yes, it's around one. So what happened? I asked 1.2. And it complained and it told me that the new value was above the interpolation range. So why did the points stop at 1? So in turn 1D does not want to extrapolate. It will not go outside of its data range. Okay? <clears throat> so I can ask it to do linear interpolation or cubic interpolation. And I can look at the doctrine, well, the doctrine of interp 1D. And we see that it's got a common argument that by default is linear, so it does linear interpolation, but I can put to cubic, for instance, to get cubic interpolation. So here, I've shown you the measures, linear interpolation and cubic interpolation. So cubic is basically a third order polynomial. And if you want to see the code that generated this figure, you can just click on the figure. This guy has a great. You can click on the figure and then you have the code that generates it. Okay, so you can see that we are interpolating, we're building a, 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 an interpolator object, and then we're evaluating it on data points between one, 0 and 1 on 50 data points. You can see here, and then we're doing the same thing with uh, cubic interpolation, and then we're plotting these guys, okay? Does that make sense? So interp 1D is a really easy to use function to do interpolation. Uh, 
something somewhere that's going to grab my attention, but I don't know where. And it's locking. It's like a bug of chrome that went. When the window is trying to get your attention, it locks the rest. Do you guys know how to get rid of it? Probably you're throwing my calendar and telling me that I'm missing the function. And you want to fit 
And once again, it, it, it's probably some form of a sine wave. It may be, once again, it may be the tide, or it may be the amount of sunlight you're getting on a, on a sensor. And you want to fit a sine wave to, to this data. <coughs> so this is what I'll, I'll show you how to do right now. Let's first generate this data. So I'm going to create a new notebook because I crashed my previous one. That's, a, that's OK, you can go ahead. OK, and work on my ZP. And uh, I'll, I'll directly uh, import a uh, 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 optimize from somewhere. And then I'm going to create this data. And I'm going to plot it. Why is the function of x? Okay, I got this. Oh, and let me let me plot it without lines so it makes more sense. Right, so I have this. This is what I have. Now I'm, I, I want to fit a sine wave to this. So what I will do is I will define Make sure this guy stays on top. So what I, what I will do is I'll define a function that I'll fit to the data. And this function I'll call it test punch. Okay, so and my test punch is going to be a sine wave with an unknown amplitude and an unknown uh, a frequency. I haven't added an unknown offset. Okay? So it's a function of x, a and b, where x is my x data, and a and b are my unknowns. And it returns the y value. Okay? So that's the, the function that I'm hypothesizing will link x to y. So the one is done. And then I will use scipy.optimize.perfect for this. And what scipy.optimize.perfect means is the test function, the x data, the y data, and a first guess for parameters. Okay? So as a first guess, I'll just put two and two because I didn't have a better idea. And what it will return is two things, the values of the parameters I'm interested in and the covariance of their error, which I may or may not be interested in. Okay? So I can I can look this up. Any questions for sir? <laughs> okay. So I can look this guy. And I can print the parameters that I found. And I found 2.8 and 1.4. Uh, uh, if we go back up, does that make sense? What should I have found? Well, 2.9 and 1.5, right? If we look at how I generated the data, but given that there is noise, that's not too bad. That makes sense? <laughs> and now what I can do is I can also uh, plot the, the, the function that, that, I, that I found. So how will I do this? I've got that funk and I will need to be visual. What I want is literally to plot the function over here. 
So how, how can I do this? Okay, so I can plot the data, let's plot the data, but I also want to plot the function. So I'm going to plot it. And I'm going to, I need to give it x, what x will I give it? Well, one thing I can do to get a nice, a nice, uh, a nice plot is I can create a dense x that covers from minus 6 to 6. And then I can evaluate the function of this dense x and plot this. That, that would probably be a... So I'm going to call this guy dense x. And I'm going to do an in space that goes from minus 6 to 6 with 100 data points. And then I'll plot dense x, dense x, and my test function evaluated on dense x with the first parameter I found and the second parameter I found. Okay? And if I manage to match my parentheses, oh no, yeah, I don't. If I manage to type this right, I should get the plot. Okay? Yeah, so I'm Alright? And just in case I was typing too fast, you can click on that curve and get the code that generates it. Click on that figure and get the code that generates it. Okay? And that's going to be true throughout the tutorial. If you want to see the code that generates a figure, you click on it and you get the code and you can download that by the uh, GPT Alright? Any questions on curve fitting? How can you choose? Why do you choose this in the as a function? Uh, I didn't choose the P0 in any clever way. I was lazy. I plugged in two things and it worked. But uh, in general, you're not guaranteed that. So, do you, you know how curve fitting works? Curve fitting works by minimizing an error between the test function uh, and the observed data. So it's a minimization problem, it's an optimization problem. And it's not guaranteed that this optimization is, and it's usually a squared error. This is a squared error, it's minimizing the squared distance. It's not guaranteed that this uh, minimization problem is complex. Hence, it's not guaranteed that it will always converge to the right solution. So ideally, so it means that the starting point matters not only for convergence speed, you know, the, the closer you start, the, the faster it will get to the optimum, but also to give you the right answer. So ideally, you have some understanding of the problem, whether it's from some physical or biological understanding, or it's just some knowledge, some expertise, and you use it to give starting points. Uh, if you have none of this, well, maybe then you need to take a few step back, write your own optimization problem, and solve it with a global optimizer, which is going to be expensive. But which is going to be what we'll see in the next uh, step. Any any other questions? Is there a nice way to handle your parameters to this test function? Yes, there is. And this is actually a Python question, not a sci-fi question, so maybe somebody can answer. Can use a star in front of the parameter. Exactly. So star in front of the list of parameters will expand it. I was purposely avoiding to do this to avoid putting too much sophisticated syntax. Okay? So, as, as, I, as, I, as we just discussed, uh, this is just a wrapper over an optimization problem. Curve fitting is just an optimization problem. So, we can go a step further and look at optimization problems in general. So we're moving to a different problem, we're moving down. There's an exercise. Do you want to do it or do you want to skip it? Don't, don't do exercises. Do you want to do it? All right, let's do it. 
So, we have those temperatures, uh, and there are temperatures that I'm told were measured in Alaska. Uh, I have a question. I'm just sure you're around the P0 values, and I just let me check. If you had no knowledge of the problem and you end up in a local solution okay. and you have absolutely no knowledge uh, of the problem, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> but that's where you know things like looking at your data should, should help you. But yes, if you're using things as a complete back box and you don't know, you know then well, that's a really good introduction to, to why optimization is important and why we should discuss it. Okay. So, so the seven values are just telling me where I start on the on the front. Yeah, so this, this is an optimization uh, 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 problem. And uh, I mean, the, way, the way you can think of it is I got those, I got those, those data points. And I'm trying to fit a sine wave to them. Let me move this guy here so it's more. So I can fit a sine wave like this. But I can also fit a sine wave like this. Both are good fits, well, for the definition of good fits. And that would be a fantastic introduction to statistical learning, why this is probably less likely than this, but it's, it's off topic. Uh, uh, but, you know, from an optimization problem, you can't tell. And now going into what's the best model that describes data is, is statistics and statistical learning, and it's something I love, but it's, it's off topic. Have people started with this? Temperatures in Alaska. Alaska gets really warm in the summer. You know what? I'll, I'll leave you working on this on the walk through now. And don't look at the solution. So, hint, when you plot, it's good to define also, a, a, so for this exercise, it's good to define an x vector. I haven't given you an x vector, I'm giving you only the y vector, but you're going to need an x vector, right, if you want to make a link. And then you need to choose uh, what's the unit of the x vector, month, days, uh, seconds, uh, uh, you choose. Mm, yeah, you, you want to like, define a vector of month or define a vector of days. to the one we've seen just before fitting a sine wave. 
and you're going to have to fit two different sine waves for the min and the max.
Now they're doing the amplitude and unknown offsets, but known uh, frequency, which was a yearly frequency, and each time I got my known frequency wrong, I would get a stupid answer. And with this, then I just did the same thing before, I, I fitted it, and in terms of, uh, of uh, guess for the parameters, well, this is, this is how I thought about it. Average seems really easy to fit. So I can put whatever I want, and zero seems okay. Because if I squint my eyes, zero average is of course wrong, but not grossly wrong. Amplitude, well, I don't want to put amplitude zero, because if I put amplitude zero, it's going to make a straight line, and that's not going to work for fitting. The reason it's not going to work for fitting is that the algorithm is going to be stuck not knowing how to modify this parameter. So I'm just putting one. Offset, well, same guess. Offset zero. Offset seems like an easy thing to fit, so offset zero should work. If I had had the frequency, because of the, the instability that we discussed before, I would have needed to put in a good guess for the frequency. Elsewhere, it would not have worked, OK? But with fairly stupid guess here, I'm pretty convinced it will work. So I put those, those very stupid guess, red optimized on curve fit, and then to plot the result, I created a, a vector of days expressed as fraction of month, right? So I know my vector of month goes from 1 to uh, 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 12, but excluding, uh, excluding 12. So I did a link space going, well, it goes from 0 to 12, excluding 12. So I did a, a link space going from 0 to 12 with 365 uh, 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 points. And then I just evaluated the expression line. And that's my fit. And it's not perfect, but good enough, I would say. Quite clearly, for, for the minimum, it's slightly more steep and more salty. Okay? Any questions on this exercise? So if you look at the solution, it's the same idea, just put more and see problem. Any questions? Yeah, maybe, maybe it's not in the solution or, or getting away. Maybe we should change. Uh, well, one remark. Uh, if you use these parameters of the test to uh, uh, more general optimization. And let's uh, uh, start with, so now we're looking at a cost function. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a different thing. It's not a test function, it's a cost function. And so here, it's just a function of one parameter, and our goal is to find the minimum of this function. Okay? And I can define it as such. I'm going to define f of x, which is x squared plus 10 times sine x. And I can just plot it, which is what I've done before, just about. But let's, uh, let's just do it together. I'm plotting it from minus 10 to 10. And this is it. So guess, guess work. 
approximate there, where's the minimum? Somewhere here. <laughs> okay, so the goal of, of uh, optimization is going to find the minimum here. And for this, oh, and by the way, what's happening here? A local minimum. A local minimum is your evil because you get stuck in that. Okay? So, what we're going to do is we're going to use a function that's called optimize.minimize. And what it takes is it takes the function and the starting point, and it tries to find the minimum. So, I'll make sure I've got optimize imported. And so optimize.minimize. And I'm giving it f and a starting point, and I'm going to start at zero. And I'm just printing the result. Okay? Alright? So what do we see? A lot of information. One of the information is that the algorithm think it was successful, so we're happy. And it tells us x equals minus 3, so that's the value of the optimum. It says that the function is minimum for x equals minus 3 dot blah blah blah. This also gives, it also gives us the, the value of the function here, right? And extra information, including one of them, which is the number of times it called the function. So if you have a very expensive function, function that, if the function is telling your grad student to go out and get more data, then this matters. Okay? And if we want to use the value x, this is, we can just call result.x, and this is going to tell us the, the, the value of our uh, okay? So, this is a very simple situation, but if you really have a big and expensive uh, function, you might evaluate it often. And that might be expensive. So, what is the algorithm you have? Okay. Well, let's, let's let's find this let's find this together. I was just I was just about to comment on it, but let's find this together. When we get a question about a function, usually the best thing to do about it is to look at its top string. So, top string. Oh, darn. Top string. And. Okay, we can see method and there's a bunch of methods. And I believe the default, okay, so the default these days is, is a BRGS. Uh, which may or may not be the uh, So it has changed, it used to be an other meaning, which kind of kills me. My, my, my next example, which was to say, hey, what if we change the method? Uh, but still, what if we change the method? And what if, so, if, if we look at this doc string, we've seen a bunch of different methods. And if you're into optimization, they mean something to you. If you're not into optimization, they don't. But it's fine, you can look them up on Wikipedia, look at, you can look them up on the advanced uh, uh, chapter of the Psychotic Journalist that describes them in, in fairly simple ways. But basically, we can choose between them. And if our function is smooth, then B of GS or LP of GS is a good choice. I'll, I'll tell you this is, I'll, I'll ask you to take it for granted. If you don't think it's good. Excuse me? Yes? Could you please change the x0 to 6? Can I do this one a, li a little bit after? I'm covering this in, 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 in a few minutes. But yeah, I'll do this. 
I, I, I say, exactly where you're going. Okay, but first, let me change the method to an LBFTS. B. Uh, so it runs, and what's interesting here? If you, if, so we're finding pretty much the same value of, of x. We're finding it pretty much. Yeah, so we're finding pretty much the same value of x as before. What's the difference? The number of function evaluations went from 24 to 12. So it called the function less a smaller number of times. So if your function is expensive to compute, the latter is twice as possible. Only if your function is expensive to compute, which is not the case here. Okay? So if you end up with expensive optimizations, then worrying about which method is used is important. And you can all use them uh, through the uh, op optimized, not minimized. Uh, so, we had a question what if we change your starting point? What if we use the starting point? Which one do you want? Did, did you want? Six. So now we get a different value. What has happened? That's the local minimum, right? So basically, our function looks like this. Let's curl up back to our function. Our function looks like this, right? So if we start around here, we're going to fall in the local limit and get stuck there. All right? So that's a bit of a problem. And that goes back to curve fitting. What if I get bad uh, starting points? I get stuck. So if we fear that we're in such a situation, we can use optimized of basin coupling which is a global uh, 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 optimizer. Okay? And so I can run it, and I can give it, and I, I will run it giving it a stupid, a, well, a non-optimal starting value like six. Okay, what do we see? It found the right minimum, right? It found x equals minus uh, 1.3. Please try it with x0 equals 4. Mm -hmm. oh. you, you got it working? Why didn't it work for me then? Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. So let's first. How does basin hopping work? The way basin hopping works is that it takes, it randomly hops. It, 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 it uses a smooth optimizer sees what part of the function it explores and randomly hops to other places. Okay? So the reason why it didn't work for you is probably you got really unlucky with your random hops. And it goes back to global optimization. Global optimization in general is an unsolved problem. So if you have a function that has bad properties, you cannot guarantee that you will find a uh, 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 And anybody who tells you different is a trouble. Uh, so you just got to look. But... Yeah, it's, I guess you just, you just keep going, and if you keep going at some point, you'll get a lucky. I'm a very lucky person. <laughs> so, yeah. So... Optimizing functions with local minima is uh, something you'd rather avoid. And if you, and you, you, you always end up being in that situation because it's right. And in which case, you'd rather have good starting positions. Okay? Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out. May I ask another question on this? 
Yes, That's so great. I iterated do you always get into the local minimum as long as I don't uh, turn up the iterations. So um, how is the random generator initialized? Is it initialized differently every time, or is it the same with the number? So I don't know, but let's try to figure out the different this out together. Does it say this? One of the reasons I don't know is I really avoid optimization problems that have a local minimum because I know how to devise my optimization problems. And so I never use this one. Um, so the doc string didn't tell me. So I can go one step further and look at the source code. That's genuinely what I do when I don't know. So two question marks <coughs> ask me the source code. So now I'm looking at the source code of the function. It starts with a doc string, and then I've got the source code. And I'll see oh, so we have a metropolis here. Uh, I would need to dig deeper. I would need to open that source file and dig deeper to tell it. Uh, so I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, there's a, 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 a directly after the doc stream, there's a random number generator set up, I think. There's some seed in So you, here, you but I did not see where the seed comes from. So you were better at looking at the source code. Where is it? It seems we have different versions of that already. That's why. <laughs> so does that seed come, is that seed an argument of your function? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the gentleman here, which which uh, uh, sci-fi version did he have? Probably more recent than me. So how do you find this way to find out? So in general, to find out the version of the, of the Python library, you import it. So import sci-fi, and then you print the library sci-fi dot, and then underscore underscore version underscore underscore. So I have O as seventeen one. You must have a more recent. So the gentleman over there has, has a, a seed argument that is set to the space in helping function. Open 19. Open 19. So you have a more recent one. So in the more recent one, they have chosen to seed the random number generator. Uh, so the function is reproducible. Uh, and, uh, but then, then being reproducible means it's also reproducibly, reproducibly bad sometimes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so the other thing that's interesting to point out is the number of function evaluations. It's huge. So if you're optimizing costly functions, they better be complex, which means, which implies that they only have a, a, a global minimum. All right? So, we only have 10 minutes left, and we've covered, I don't know what fraction of a bit. I seem to remember I used to be able to cover this in an hour, but that's probably <laughs> So we're just going to have to make choices. And let me go back to the list of things we could cover. And I'll comment on this. So optimize, uh, there's one thing that I haven't covered. And it's root finding. So if you if you scroll down a bit, you will have find root finding. Oh, one thing I have covered with, with uh, optimization is we can add constraints. Uh, you just you can easily add bound constraints by adding the keyword bound. Okay. So basically, if I want to lock my optimization between zero and ten, x between zero and ten, then the solver will work only between zero and ten. Uh, and then there's root finding, which is the idea that I'm trying to find the, the values where f of x is equal to zero. 
So it's similar idea than minimization, and you have optimized out root, which does the same thing. Okay? And in general, it's solved by a, by a special minimization problem. Okay? Uh, then we have statistics. So then I'll, I'll consider that we're done with optimize. We could talk about optimization for hours or days. I love it. But, but in the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, there is statistics, so SciPy has very basic statistics support, but basically a bunch of interesting things it has is that it has distribution objects. So SciPy.stats <coughs> has, for instance, the uh, normal distribution, excludes SciPy.stats.norm for normal. And that distribution, normal, has a PDF, primitive density function, a CDF, uh, a cumulative density function, a nice set and only a zoo of different uh, statistical um, uh, methods. So you can compute all these. Uh, if another, so you have this for the normal distribution, for the gamma distribution, for I guess the Poisson, the beta, all this zoo of distributions. If you're into distributions, you know this and you like this. Another interesting thing of these distributions is that if you give them data and you call fit, so stats.norm.fit, the distribution will estimate its internal parameters. And for the normal distributions, we have two internal parameters, which is the location of the center and the standard deviation. So it will do this, and it will do this by a maximum likelihood estimate, so a good estimate. Uh, and this will work for all the, all the distributions. So you can work with distribution. And we'll skip the exercise in the interest of time, and you can compute mean and medians, which we will also skip in the interest of time. And you can compute a bunch of statistical tests. So what are statistical tests? So suppose you're observing uh, distribute, uh, you're observing data from two different uh, populations, like the Germans and the French. You're going to try to see if the Germans speak better English than the French, so we, we give a, a English proficiency test to the Germans and the French, and we have only a dozen of results because testing people is expensive, and then when we compare the population. So then what we're going to do, so we're going to find the difference, right? Uh, unless, unless we're extremely lucky or unlucky, we are going to find a difference because we're, because we're going to test a dozen people here, and the people there are going to get numbers, and because there is you know, noise, random right sampling, we're going to find a difference. Is this difference significant or not? Are we going to write a paper that reports the Germans speak better English than the French? Uh, which I believe is true, by the way, uh, being French. Uh, and, uh, but if we write this, we need to know whether the difference that we found is significant or whether it could be just chance. And this is known as a statistical test. Statistical testing is, is a science, not an art. It's a, it's a difficult one, but uh, at least SciPy gives you the major statistical tests. So if you know that you want to be using a t-test from two independent samples to compare the Germans from the French, then you can use scipy.stats.ttest in for t-test independent. And it will return the p-value well, it went to the t statistic and the p value. The p value being the probability that the two set of numbers are the same under the chance. So if you follow, I have a very small p value. Does that mean that the Germans and the French speak uh, English differently? So what's the definition of the p value? It's the probability of observing what you've observed under chance. If it's small, it means that the reason is probably significant. Okay? And if you're interested in this, there's a chapter inside of the channel that goes way more into detail. I need to skip 
integration, I'm just going to mention that we can compute numerically integrals of functions, or we can integrate uh, uh, differential equations. So here is just a depth equation where I'm, I'm saying that uh, uh, my, uh, uh, I have a damping force that's proportional to uh, how far I am. Well, I've got a, not a damping force, a recoil force that's proportional to how far I am from zero. I let my, my system go and it will progressively go to zero. That's, that's known as a differential equation. And you can integrate that numerically here. So if you add uh, a damping, then you can get uh, an oscillator behavior. We have FFTs uh, for your transforms, and preparing this tutorial, my conclusions about FFTs are the following. If you know what you're doing in signal processing and applied math, you want to use FFTs. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't want to use them, even if you think you do. <laughs> that is seriously my conclusion. If you want to compute the power spectral density of a, a signal, you can try to compute it with an FFT, and if you know what you're doing, you're going to do it right, and if you don't, you're going to, to get it wrong. So what do you want to do? You want to move on to signal processing. Oh, and if, and if you try to implement filter with FFTs, you can, it's very easy, and you'll get it wrong. So don't do it. And so you can move on to signal processing. And so signal processing is typically well, that really was my conclusion. I'm trying to find good examples of using FFT, and they were all very complex. I could only find simple but bad examples of using FFT. Uh, signal processing, sci-fi not signal, is basically to deal with 1D regularly sample signals. So it will allow you to do things like resampling, so typically uh, uh, interpolation, both for 1D uh, uh, regularly sample signal. It will allow you to do things like detrending or uh, 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 Median filter or linear filtering? Linear filtering is a good guess if you don't know what you're doing about filtering and you want to do some remove uh, 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 um, uh, uh, high, high frequency. Uh, and you can compute a power spectrum density using a proper method. So once again, don't implement it yourself. Okay? Uh, moving on. Uh, there is a bit of image manipulation in, in as I mentioned, in sci-fi about any image. And we have things like, uh, you know, geometrical transform, so like shearing, uh, rotating, shifting. Uh, we have things like filtering, Gaussian filtering, median filtering. I'm using the Venu filter from Sigma here. Uh, and <coughs> We have things like mathematical morphology. So mathematical morphology, let me skip to this example, is applying a set of extremely simple operations to boundaries. That's not a mathematical definition, but it's okay. And you can use it typically to uh, remove <coughs> patterns that are smaller than uh, one pixel if you're applying it once, or, tw or two pixel if you're applying it twice. So this is typically useful for cleaning uh, uh, binary images. Uh, one important comment on this is that these operations may be useful even if you're not doing image processing. If you're trying to, if you're doing, you know, parameter search, and your threshold in your brain, your search, and then you're trying to clean it in some way. This is not an image operation in the sense we're not taking pictures and processing pictures. But it may be useful. And often people forget that if they have a 2D or 3D array that doesn't come from an image, it may be useful to apply an image on it. Okay? And the last very useful uh, thing in an image is uh, label and connect components. So, if here I ask you to color every object in a different color, you'll do it. You won't have any problems. Now, label and connect component is doing the exact same thing. It's assigning a different number to every connect component. And once again, this may be extremely useful outside of image processing. It may work on a 1D signal. 
you have a 1D signal, you threshold it, and then you want to find the largest interval. You may then, what you may do is you may uh, use uh, any image dot label to label the connect components here. And then any image dot sub, any image dot sub will sum the value of, of the, the image of the data on each connect component, on each, no, sorry, on each label. So if I give it as a label the connect component, then I'm, I'm finding the sum of the, the data on each connect component. Okay? So I can use this to do things like finding the largest connect component. Just, just keep in mind that if you want to operate on connect components, any image is there for you. And this is the end. We have plenty of exercises that we won't have time to cover. Uh, I think to respect copy break, I should stop here. Uh, you can always come back to this material or to the sci-fi documentation, and if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you.